If you're even vaguely aware about indie horror games in the last 10 years, then the name Five Nights at Freddy's should ring a bell. What was once an overnight sensation created by Scott Cawthon back in 2014 as a byproduct of criticism aimed at his slightly creepy looking Christian games, quickly became a juggernaut of a media franchise, spawning sequels, books, toys, and much, much more. Well, you know what they say. Once you make knickknacks, you never go back. It may or may not have started the trend of family-friendly horror, or horror games for kids too. Something which will get a little more questionable when we look into these games in more detail, but there has to be more to the series than just, oh god oh fuck, the creepy bear's looking at me funny, the memes, and the supposedly endless supply of jump scares. Well, that's what I'm here to find out with... this. This is the Five Nights at Freddy's Core Collection, a physical release of the series for PS4, Xbox One and Nintendo Switch, consisting of the first five games in the series. I'll get this out of the way now though. Where the hell is Pizzeria Simulator? You'd think if they were porting the original games onto a disc, they'd at least include the conclusion. Ultimate Custom Night, I understand, that is a very busy game with a lot of shit going on. But the finale to the series? Maybe in the future they'll release an updated version of the collection with Pizzeria Simulator and UCN, but for the time being I'm only going to cover what's included on the disc. Anyway. We install each game from the disc, starting with Five Nights at Freddy's 1. Originally released in 2014, FNAF 1 sees you take up a position advertised in the newspaper for the Night Guard at Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, a Chuck E. Cheese-esque restaurant complete with anthropomorphic animal mascots of its own. All you have to do is keep an eye on the place until 6am, but as you most likely know by now, there's a twist. These beloved children's icons tend to get a bit more active after hours, and will assume that any human they come across is an endoskeleton outside of its costume. They'll roam around the establishment with you in their line of sight, and you are stuck in your office until morning with only a limited power supply and your wits at your disposal. It's a very, very simple premise, but it works, and it works extremely well. Why is that? The best place to start would probably be the game's namesake and his friends. These guys have fantastic designs that slip right into the uncanny valley. They're clearly not human, yet don't look very cartoony. It's their appearances, paired with their weird motive, that radiates malice, leading me to say that as horror game villains I think they've aged quite well, both visually and conceptually. We have Freddy Fazbear, the lead singer of the troupe who is inactive for now unless you run out of power, Bonnie the Bunny, the bass guitarist who will approach your left door, Cheek of the Chicken, local cupcake enthusiast, the backing vocalist probably, and approaches your right door, no, Chica Cupcake is not an instrument, and Foxy the Pirate, who resides in the now out of order Pirate's Cove, and will eventually make a mad dash to your office via the West Corridor. Have the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse ever been so recognisable? Each one has a distinct movement pattern that makes them easy to keep track of until things gradually get more chaotic. Gameplay wise, it's also very simple, but that's not to say it's easy, exactly. You see them standing in a darkened room, you feel so happy when they're not with you, but then they see you caught you by surprise, a single teardrop falling from your eye. Since you can't leave your office, the only way you can keep track of the animatronics during the shift is through the security cameras. If you feel as though something is outside, you can use your lights to confirm it for yourself, and if there is, your only line of defence are the respective doors, which can be opened and closed at will, but there's a catch. Whatever you do to ward off any threats will only drain your power faster. Insert obligatory, it costs power to close the doors comment? Use it all and your only hope is for the clock to strike 6 before Freddy finishes you off. So technically speaking, this is a survival horror game. Move over Resident Evil! And much like Resident Evil, every action you take has to feel deliberate, which is panic inducing when something so unexpected could happen at any time. Like when the cameras temporarily go offline, or Bonnie and Chica are eyeing you from the side like a PS5 or Xbox Series X on Black Friday. You need to be methodical, but quick to react and change your focus on the fly if necessary. Failure to do so, whether you waste too much power or let an animatronic in while you're distracted with the cameras, will result in... Gesundheit. Due to horror being so subjective, jump scares are a rather tricky subject to discuss. They can be effective when done well, but more often than not, they're used as a cheap tactic just to get a reaction from the viewer, or in this case, the player. Some people may call this series something along the lines of a jump scare fest, without really taking a step back to see why said jump scare was triggered. These jump scares do not appear one after the other like some people might claim they do. Yet. 
Despite this, the first Five Nights at Freddy's does these exceptionally well in my opinion. In FNAF 1, the jump scares are the punishment. They are the penalty of sorts, a consequence for doing something wrong. And when the jump scares happen, it's a sudden jolt that releases tension, and it feels earned because of the build-up. It may not be that scary so early on, but Night 4 is when the intensity is ramped up significantly. The game demands more of your attention, and you know that just one slip-up could potentially result in your demise and a swift return to 12am. If you're good enough, you can probably finish up to Night 5 without seeing a single jump scare anyway. The noise in particular can really catch you off guard, working effectively with the animatronics manically flailing and shaking you to top it off. Five Nights at Freddy's 1 has some damn good sound design, actually. The diegetic sounds like foxy humming, ominous pipe organ music, and a handful of other red herrings are designed to make you feel uneasy, but there are plenty of other sound cues that can aid you if you understand what they are, or what causes them. For example, under normal circumstances, the doors and lights will make loud fuds and buzzing, respectively. That's your extra layer of reassurance that they work. It'll all seem well and good until you try to check them, and all you hear is a pathetic... You know that the mechanism's been tampered with, and your chances of getting screwed have increased significantly. Another strong use of sound is the kitchen's camera. The video feed isn't present, but you can still hear the sounds it picks up, most notably the clanging of pots, pans, and ovens, caused by Chica. This means that as long as you can hear that metallic racket, you don't have to look for her. Similarly, the Toreador march can be heard when Freddy is in the kitchen, or before he kills you after running out of power. Speaking of Freddy, he'll become active upon reaching the latter half of Night 3, probably because I ended up comparing his jaw to that of Herbert from Family Guy. Please tell me I'm not the only one that sees this. You can tell when he moves because a very deep laugh can be heard, no matter how far away he is in the restaurant. Much like the other animatronics, you can stall him by checking his position every once in a while, but unlike the others, he's typically shrouded in complete darkness, so you really have to look for him. Or more specifically, his beady eyes, making any potential jump scares all the more startling. The darkness of the pizzeria is very well utilised, heavily emphasising the feelings of defencelessness and loneliness. It's big, dark, and spacious, making most of your attempted killers and rare imagery stand out. The only place where your visibility isn't obscured so heavily is your office, and even then it still feels claustrophobic and metallic, a reminder that nowhere is safe to hide, making every close call from nightfall onwards feel like a last moment save. I will say I don't remember this office, or the game as a whole for a matter of fact, looking this jagged in YouTube videos. Maybe this is an issue with the console port? The engine, perhaps? I'm not too certain if I'm being honest. But how can I go on for this long and not mention the lore the game has to offer? From the beginning of the game, your only guide is this guy on the phone who leaves these pre-recorded messages for you at the beginning of your shifts. He'll tell you that the animatronics will get more aggressive as the week goes on, but will also spoon-feed you little bits of world-building every now and again as well. Most notably, the infamous Bite of 87, where one of the mascots got too close to a child and took a nice big chomp of their frontal lobe. On top of that, the rules poster in Camera 4B will cycle through a series of newspaper articles detailing the controversy surrounding the restaurant. Stuff like children going missing and the animatronics starting to smell leaking blood and mucus. This gave the fans a lot to discuss, but before Phone Guy can begin a Q&A session about any of this, he gets killed mid-recording on Night 4. So all you've got for Night 5 is... From this point on, there's no real reason to keep checking on Bonnie or Chica. Instead, your attention needs to be focused on Pirate's Cove, and wherever the hell Freddy is, since Foxy is quick to attack after leaving his curtains, and the Top Hat Boy will never backtrack. We only just make it through Night 5 because the bastard bunny wouldn't bugger off, and we get rewarded with a paycheck of $120, as well as a sixth night and a star on the main menu. Night 6 is more or less a stricter version of Night 5. I managed to clinch that too, and get another star on the menu, plus an extra 50 cents for... overtime? How generous. This then unlocks the seventh night, where we can customise each animatronic's AI to be as docile or hostile as we want. Hold on, let me type in 1987 real quick. Nice. And yes, I did make an attempt to complete Night 7 on 420 mode to get the trophy, a third star on the menu, and my own sick self-satisfaction with complimentary bragging rights, and no, I couldn't beat it. Freddy comes to visit you in a record six seconds. It's absolutely doable, 
but the challenge is clearly made for people with more skill than myself, which is perfectly fine. To this day, eight years later, I still believe that Five Nights at Freddy's 1 is a great little gem of a horror game. It's creepy, suspenseful, and stressful, but in a rather fun and exhilarating way. It feels very arcadey, making it a very good choice as a quick pick-up-and-play option, and it has its challenging moments to master and easter eggs to uncover for more hardcore fans as well. Then came the first of many, many sequels. Not long after the game hit the mainstream with Let's Players, Theorists, and Easter Egg Hunters, plus an overwhelming fanbase surrounding it, Colvin saw the perfect opportunity to create a sequel. Announced just one month after the first game's release, and released ahead of schedule, also in 2014, Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was boasting itself to be bigger and better than before. While it absolutely was bigger, was it really better? Let's find out. Oh, a cutscene? Hi Bonnie. Hi Chica. What the f- Just like the first game, FNAF 2 sees us take the job of Night Guard for a new Freddy Fazbear's establishment. Night 1 serves as a tutorial to help us get accustomed to this new location, with free reign to try out all the new mechanics and get used to the differences for the first two hours, but the objective remains the same, last until 6am. Phone Guy is back to talk us through the new gameplay as well, but didn't he, you know, perish? Something you'll probably take note of immediately is that this new office has no doors. Only a vent to your left, the same on your right, and a great big gaping hallway smack dab in front of you. Much like the first game, the animatronics are a little too docile for the lack of doors to be much of an issue just yet. Night 2 onwards is where things start to get a little busy, however. Let's go over the gameplay first this time around. Just like in FNAF 1, the animatronics will try and get into your office, the excuse this time being that due to the lack of a real night mode, when the room is silent, they think they're in the wrong place and will try to head off to try and find the party, i.e. humans, ergo you are quite literally the life of the party, for better or worse. Even though you have no doors, you do have a spare Freddy head by your side as a substitute, that way you have a method of confusing them when they set foot in the office. Yes, you have to let them in, to get them to leave. Having the animatronics get so close to you that you need to put on a spare mask until they give up can be really chilling, especially when they can abruptly pull your monitor down, giving you mere seconds to react accordingly. But if you take too long, you're dead, unsurprisingly. <laughs> the cameras make a return, but unlike before, looking at them doesn't drain your power. The only resource that can run the battery dry here is the torch. Not only can you use it in your office, but also while viewing the cameras as well. This way you can light up the rooms to take note of where some of your relentless hunters are, and push back others. Something worth noting is that FNAF 2 allows more than one animatronic to show up in the same place at the same time. Just a little quirk with the first game that I'm glad was improved here. The last important thing you can do to delay your death is winding up the music box. Situated in the prize corner in camera 11, the music box will slowly wind down, and every chance you get, you must wind it up to keep the marionette at bay. Later in the game, cam 11 will most likely be the only camera you'll pay attention to, since you have no time to do anything else. Out of these three mechanics, you can only perform one action at a time. This does lead into some nerve-wracking scenarios, as you're always leaving yourself open to an assault from whatever you're not attending to, and it creates some hectic situations, but from what I'll discuss later, this also ends up contributing to the game's overbearing detriment, in my opinion. On the topic of being open to attacks, let's take a look at the roster. One of the ways Corfin wanted to make FNAF 2 a bigger game was by expanding the cast from 4 to 10 for nights 1 through 5. We have the quartet from the first game, who have seen better days, Toy versions of Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica, a broken down toy Foxy known as the Mangle, used as a pick apart, put together attraction, you know, typical fun, safe playtime activity, the aforementioned Marionette, and a new character called Balloon Boy. The Withered versions of the Bear, Bunny, and Chicken will function similarly to their toy variants, gradually making their way towards the office and using the mask will drive them away. For just £2 a month, you can help this chicken find a beak. Why two pounds and not two dollars? Look at those teeth, they're clearly British, and I should know. And why was she made to look hot? You sicken me. Withered Foxy will be where most of your flashlight power will be dispensed. Instead of approaching you normally, he'll stand at the end of the hallway. Menacingly! He isn't tricked by the Freddy mask, so while he's standing there, you need to flash your light to make him leave. I'm not too certain on how Mangle works, but once it's in your office, it's a complete gamble on whether or not they choose to attack when you put the mask on, or use the cameras. 
Lastly, Balloon Boy. This little shit. He'll function the exact same as all the other animatronics, but instead of killing you, he'll disable your lights when he makes his way in, making you highly vulnerable to Foxy. Because of this, Foxy may be your most likely cause of death. Once you realise that the ideal strategy is to wind the box on camera 11, put the monitor down and immediately wear the head in case something's too close for comfort, check the entry points, blind Foxy if he's close, rinse and repeat, the game can feel much easier than FNAF 1, and as a result, less scary. You don't really need to know what's on the other cameras since, like I said, it's not like you actually have time to check them past the game's halfway point. That's not the only thing that makes me feel this way, either. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 is a lot more RNG heavy compared to the first game. Sure, with so many threats out to get you it's more unpredictable and spontaneous than its predecessor, but at the same time it feels like a case of too many cooks in the pizzeria's kitchen. Even though I just said FNAF 2 can feel easier, that's not to say that it is easier, if you get where I'm coming from. It becomes less of a matter of skill, and more so comes down to luck, especially during Night 5 onwards. Quite often in this game, you will find yourself painted into corners completely out of your control that you simply cannot overcome. I also don't think the animatronics are all that scary compared to FNAF 1 either. There are some great designs in there, like Mangle, Withered Freddy, and Withered Chica in particular, but the rest? Eh. The toy animatronics lean way too far into the cutesy field and end up paling in comparison to the first game's unnerving, uncanny, and expressionless antagonists. But enough about the characters, what about sound design? There's a lot of helpful audio cues in this game to compensate for the more frantic style of play. Like, a lot of helpful audio cues. Vents banging, Mangle static, BB's voice. I don't think there's anything wrong with these cues, but one that annoys me specifically is that goddamn ambience that plays every time an enemy is close by. It can still create this sense of urgency, but it's a double-edged sword because now I definitely know something is nearby. Compare this to the Stinger cue from FNAF 1. It's quick, and it's just enough to try and get you to stumble at what could be the night's final hurdle. FNAF 2's ambience is a constant sound until whatever's nearby leaves, so I'm left less panic-stricken, and I find it a lot less effective at creating tension. Needless to say, I think that the atmosphere in 2 doesn't feel anywhere near as strong or oppressive as 1. When we complete Night 5, not only do we get our paycheck, but said paycheck is dated for 1987, meaning FNAF 2 isn't a sequel, but rather a prequel. Just like before, we also get access to a sixth night, where Golden Freddy can now appear, and after beating that, we see another news article stating that the pizzeria will be closing down, and the old decaying characters will be salvaged for a new location. And as if that wasn't enough for 12 to 13 year old me, there's more little bits of lore sprinkled about. This time, a weird cutscene will play in between most nights, taking place in FNAF 1's restaurant with Golden Freddy and the puppet making appearances. I don't quite know what these mean, but seeing Bonnie and Chica look at Freddy like he just picked his nose in public is pretty funny to me. There's also a slim chance that instead of being taken back to the main menu upon death, an Atari-style minigame will appear in its place, four in total and each one leaving more questions than the answer, with most, if not all of them, ending with jump scares and depicting child murder in some way. Horror games? For kids! There is a lot here, and it gave the fans quite a bit to discuss, such as the relevance of a mysterious purple guy who makes multiple appearances. Seriously, this is a fair bit for me to handle at the time, and I'm still impressed that details like this could be coherently portrayed as well as they are, given the retro aesthetic. It didn't give too much away, however, leaving certain details ambiguous for another sequel to tie up later. And I think that's all there is to discuss about Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Is it a good game? Yeah, definitely. Do I think it's a good horror game? Kinda. Do I think it's an improvement over the original? Eh. What really kills Five Nights at Freddy's 2 for me is how the game tries to embody the whole bigger is better trope. This is most notable when it comes to the roster, which to be fair does result in faster paced gameplay compared to FNAF 1, giving it a much more unique identity, but at the same time it's a double edged sword because now there's far too much going on. And because of the bigger roster and balancing act gameplay, survival is a lot more RNG centric to the point where I don't think it reaches that same level of intensity or panic. If you're screwed, you can roughly pinpoint when something's coming long before it happens. I still enjoy coming back to it, but if I had to choose which was the objectively better horror game, I'd say FNAF 1 for its fairer challenge and better atmosphere. FNAF 2 is still a damn fine game though, impressing a lot of people so eventually we got a third game. Intended to be the conclusion to the series, sure. 
Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was released in 2015 to tie up any loose ends 2 left behind. We take on yet another night guard vacancy, but instead of being in a restaurant, we're keeping an eye on Fazbear's Fright, the horror attraction based on the rumours of a pizzeria chain. This is actually a refreshing change of pace. Another dude on the phone talks you through the first night, and this is the easiest night one of the series. He explains that they're currently searching for relics, and pretty much anything to really spook thrill seekers, but as of yet, have found nothing. Therefore, there's nothing really out to get you for the time being. Call it lazy if you wish, but this is understandable from a gameplay perspective, since FNAF 3 is quite a departure from the previous games for a fair number of reasons. This gives you plenty of time to figure out and understand the basics of the new mechanisms introduced, such as the maintenance panel on your left, and the separate, and kinda shitty, camera system on the right. More on those later. Night 2 is when the real game starts, with Phone Dude excited to share the news that they found a real animatronic suit. By the end of this call, he uses these old training tapes of the phone guy from the original pizzerias as a substitute guide, meaning that you've got to piece together your vague knowledge of the new systems at your disposal to protect yourself against Springtrap until 6am. So how does this new character work? As you'd expect, he'll slowly make his way towards the office, but this time you must pseudo-interact with and distract the looming threat. You can track him via the cameras and lure him into adjacent rooms with the audio clips of FNAF 2's Balloon Boy. So, if he's wandered off, play that audio clip by the nearest camera, and 9 times out of 10, he'll follow the sound. He'll also try exploiting the ventilation system to get to you faster too, so if you can hear him enter the vents, toggle the cameras to track him that way, and seal the correct one before he can make it out. You can only seal one vent at a time, however, so it's best to try and shut the one that's closest to him if you can. And just like Freddy in the original game, he can hide well. Too well. He blends into the environment to the point where he's not always noticeable, making up for the fact that it's just the one animatronic that can kill you, but at the same time, this game is set in the future and it looks like you're watching a place on a fucking CRT TV. He's a lot more challenging to track compared to everyone else before him. The cheeky bugger could be hiding off the side of a camera, a vague silhouette can occasionally be seen, and his eyes will sometimes be the most prominent. He can get a little bit excited and just kind of teleport from point A to point B in the matter of seconds, which can get a bit annoying, but ideally you want to try juggling him between the same few rooms. Real quick, I really want to talk about how awesome Springtrap's design is. I remember looking at the early teaser screenshots where you could just about spot a rotting corpse inside of a tattered broken Springlock suit. The suit itself even manages to look sinister while simultaneously being devoid of any human emotions. It's brilliant. Over time, there is a high chance that the systems you've come to rely on will end up going offline. Unlike the power supplies from before, you can reboot them to get them back in working order, however. You can reboot each one individually for about 5 seconds, or all of them for roughly 10. The tricky decisions come in when multiple systems are down, and you need to make the tough calls to survive, so it's best to consider this as FNAF 3's version of FNAF 2's balancing act, except I find this one a lot more manageable. Sure, the way the ventilation system behaves can be a bit funky, but the audio and camera feeds have very specific times they can be used before they start breaking down. If your audio goes offline, you can't distract Springtrap. If your cameras go offline, you can't keep track of him, and if the ventilation goes down, you're at your most vulnerable to attacks. The vents can also be shut off by hallucinatory animatronics, some of which make even more systems shut off too. You're left to your own devices, no pun intended, to make priorities, making taking your eyes off the cameras for one reason or another pretty nerve-wracking at times. But as long as you get into a consistent rhythm, you should be fine. Should you need to take your eyes off the camera, you must rely on your ears to listen for his movements, and I don't think they're anywhere near as annoying as the incessant droning of FNAF 2. And because there's multiple paths of Springtrap to take, it creates this mildly distressing sense of unpredictability without being too on the nose. Now, even though Springtrap is the only animatronic that can harm you in this game, that's not to say he's the only one that can jump scare you. Remember those hallucinations I mentioned earlier? Well, it seems that regardless of how often you reboot the ventilation, they still have a fairly high chance of appearing, turning this game into an actual jump scare fest. It is possible to negate some of their effects before they do attack, but you've got about a split second to do so. I feel that the insulting part is that they're not even scary, not even spring traps. Every single jump scare, except maybe Phantom Foxy, is telegraphed in some way, or at least Foxy is the only one that catches me off guard. But Freddy? You stare at him for too long. Chica or BB? They'll appear on certain cameras in ways that's so blatantly obvious it comes across as desperate. Like I said, Springtrap's jump scares are not scary, but rather disappointing, which to me is far worse. Don't see what I mean? Let's compare, shall we? FNAF 1. Lots of shrieking and shaking. FNAF 2. Lunging towards you or appearing from under your desk. FNAF 3. 
Hey, I'm going to McDonald's, do you want anything? He doesn't even do anything to you, making him feel like some kind of curious child just wondering what you're doing. And don't get me started on Phantom Mangle or Marionette, neither of which cause a jump scare, but will disable at least two of your systems, and in the latter's case, stopping you from doing anything for a lengthy amount of time. This isn't challenging or scary, it's just really fucking annoying. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 just isn't that interesting to look at either. Most of the colour scheme during the main game consists of these really murky greens and browns that make it look pretty bland compared to FNAF 1 and 2. And FNAF 1 took place in near total darkness. I'm certain the nights in FNAF 3 are much shorter than in the other games as well, lasting roughly 3 to 4 minutes each. I don't know if to call this a good or a bad thing, so I'm just going to label it a neutral thing and move swiftly on. Of course, with FNAF 3 initially intended to be the series' conclusion, there's a bit more lore to unpack, mostly from these interactive 8-bit sequences that occur after every night. The first four depict one of the original character mascots following a Purple Freddy costume, but each animatronic will reach this specific room where their journeys will abruptly end, an error stopping them from proceeding. As they all turn and leave, the purple guy will run out at them and disassemble them one by one. Night 5 sequence then sees us play as one of the ghost children, and we can now enter this mystery room. Inside we see four other spirits and a frantic purple guy. Walking up to him will make him scurry over to the opposite side of the room until he puts on the nearby springlock suit. He laughs like he's gotten away with his crimes, somehow, but if you paid attention to the training tapes, you'd know that water and springlock mechanisms don't mix, resulting in a malfunction that crushes the killer while he's still inside the suit and the ghosts vanish. Family friendly horror! So yeah, the one thing we've been trying to prevent reaching us was actually the child murderer all along. Woods could not describe how amazing I find this reveal to be, and it still makes replaying the game feel that bit more interesting. This then takes us to a screen claiming we got the bad ending, implying that the souls are still haunting the machines. So, for the first time in the series, there's a solid excuse to replay the game. But how do you reach this so-called good ending? Clues. Lots of them. During the first four 8-bit sequences, you'll come across a series of hints in a corridor to the southwest part of the dilapidated building, each of which are directions to accessing hidden minigames. Since I'm on PS4, the method to reaching this secret ending can be a bit convoluted, so I had to look up a guide because how anyone was able to figure this shit out with a lack of a cursor is beyond me. Despite all the hoops you have to jump through, FNAF 3's minigames are some of the best in the series. Instead of beating them normally, you must intentionally glitch out of bounds to find the secret exits, most of which involve giving cake to a crying child. There is an extra minigame that I don't think the game provides any sort of hint for to my knowledge, but once the other ones are done, you can play this one where you see a group of ghost children celebrating a birthday party. When everyone's gathered, the last child will put on their Freddy mask, and then they all disappear. Beating Night 5 and watching the purple guy's sequence this time will give us the good ending. The lights are off, and the souls are finally laid to rest. Is it a lot to get through? Yes. But reaching that ending and hearing that music makes it all feel worthwhile. Night 6 is unlocked regardless, but under the name of Nightmare Mode. Nightmare is probably one of the hardest six nights in the series because of how relentless Springtrap can be, and unlike the six nights of FNAF 1 and 2, I haven't beaten it yet. We also get access to an extras menu for our troubles, most likely to compensate for the lack of a custom night in this game, where the more we complete, we unlock more content. This is a good way to encourage the player to carry on and replay the game. To summarise, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 gives me a lot of mixed feelings. In some ways it is an improvement over the other two, but falls flat in areas where FNAF 1 and 2 excelled. The strongest aspect by far is the story. You can really sympathise with these 8-bit murder victims, and having the culprit come after you during the night shift is such a brilliant idea. However, despite the gameplay being a bit more involved than prior entries, it leaves a lot to be desired, with FNAF 3 just not invoking that much fear into the player even though this game's set in a horror attraction. While I did enjoy playing Five Nights at Freddy's 3, safe to say there are plenty of missed opportunities here, making this game feel very polarising and underwhelming to me. But now the trilogy is finished, and the story is complete. FNAF finally had closure. Then Five Nights at Freddy's 4 showed up, 